I'm Henry Fortunato, uh, Director of Public Affairs. You, you know, this is, this is kind of a surreal moment for me. Uh, when I was a kid growing up on Long Island, I watched many of Henry Block's TV commercials. I, I'm sure many of you remember them as well. They were classics, particularly the ones where Henry would outline one of the 17 reasons why people should let H&R Block prepare their taxes. So um, in that spirit, welcome to uh, tonight's tutorial on the 17 reasons why you should use the new H&R Block Business and Career Center at the Kansas City Public Library. Um, reason number one, by special arrangement with the Internal Revenue Service, for the next three years, any overdue fines that you incur on books or materials checked out from the H&R Block Business and Career Center will be tax deductible. <laughs> Reason number two, if you can prove that the knowledge resources available from the H&R Block Business and Career Center were key to the launch of your successful entrepreneurial venture, the library, meaning Henry and Crosby, will not hit you up for a donation until 2015. I have more, but Crosby said I couldn't use them. <laughs> so, in all seriousness, thank you very much for joining us tonight to celebrate the opening of the H&R Block Business and Career Center. Thanks to H&R Block and the H&R Block Foundation, this new space is the latest enhancement to the Central Library and marks yet another milestone in the continuing revival of downtown Kansas City. That previous statement was not hyperbole. Two years ago, right around now, thanks to a generous grant from the Durwood Foundation, we opened up the Stanley Durwood Film Vault, a state-of-the-art screening room in the old safe deposit vault on the lower level of this building, where movie series are shown every Monday night and every Saturday afternoon. One year ago, also around this time, and thanks to the Francis Family Foundation, Aquila, and the Dickinson Family Foundation, we opened an expanded and renovated children's library on the second floor of this building. It provides a safe and comfortable space for reading, story time, activities, and teen computer use. And eight months ago, the Kaufman Foundation validated our approach in, to enhancing civic engagement and public discourse with a $4 million grant over five years to support our various public programming initiatives. In many ways, we are achieving the destiny that Dr. Vartan Gregorian, formerly president of the New York Public Library and Brown University, and now chief executive of the Carnegie Corporation, set out for Kansas City when he helped kick off the Central Library's capital campaign in October 2002. As he put it, I believe the new library, he was referring to the Central Library, will grace the city, help stimulate a downtown renaissance, and most importantly, be better able to play a central role in the cultural, intellectual, and democratic life of the entire metropolitan community. A portion of his remarks bear special resonance tonight when we dedicate this new H&R Block Business and Career Center, especially with its emphasis on learning entrepreneurship, finding jobs, developing careers, and enhancing financial literacy. According to Dr. Gregorian, libraries are a laboratory of human aspiration, a window to the future, and a wellspring of action. They are a medium of progress, autonomy, empowerment, independence, and self-determination. Libraries, he concluded, are vehicles for self-renewal. The H&R Block Business and Career Center is all about all of these things. It's a place where people can access tools and information, improve skills, and gain the knowledge necessary to become the next generation of Kansas City entrepreneurs and business leaders. Speaking of leaders, before I pass the baton to Jonathan Kemper for his remarks, I do want to take a moment to acknowledge some of the present day members of the leadership of Greater Kansas City who honor us by their presence tonight. Or at least they told me they were going to honor us by their presence tonight. Um, uh, County Executive Mike Sanders, 
um, City Council members, Mel Curls, Dan Markison, and Beth Gottstein, Clyde McQueen, head of the Full Employment Council, Bill Dietrich from the Downtown Council, Maria Myers from KC SourceLink, and most importantly, to me anyway, the Library's Board of Trustees. Olivia Dorsey is here, Dave Maida, Billy Howard Barnes, Joan Caulfield, Rosemary Bell, Leon Dixon, and Claudia Annate Grime. And of course, Board President Jonathan Kemper, who had the original vision for the rebirth of the Central Library in this magnificent building and has nursed and pushed and prodded to make it a reality. Ladies and gentlemen, before I introduce Jonathan Kemper, just one little bit of housekeeping. The program takes place here, the conversation with Henry Block and Crosby Kemper. After that, you can take the stairs or the elevator to the third floor for the grand opening and ribbon cutting for the Block Business and Career Center. After that, there'll be a small dessert reception. I suggest the stairs, the elevators will get clogged. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome Jonathan Kemper. There are a lot of people involved in this library, and, and I've always walked by this, this building secretly admiring it, thinking it, it could come to a better use than its previous owner had put it to. <laughs> but I, I, on behalf of the Board of Trustees, I would like to add my welcome to the library, which is really your library, now celebrating its fifth year in uh, the new Central Library. The completion of the Block Business Center is the last major component. Henry went through a number of the things that happened. This is the one that uh, we had on our list uh, that's still to, still to do. And while it's been five years and four library directors in the making, I believe that the final product, which, which focuses on employment and entrepreneurship, couldn't be more timely. And with its broad access to new media and the communication simply couldn't have done before, before or at an earlier date or as well. So I, I think you'll all be very pleased with the product. As Henry Fortunato mentioned, the enabling grants came from the H&R Block Corporation and Foundation. H&R Block has always been among the first rank of corporate citizens of our community. And I want to recognize Russ Smythe, who is the H&R Block CEO, and David Miles from the H&R Block Foundation for their respective institutions' generous support and interest in the success of this center. Russ and, and David, where are you? Russ is that very unassuming man with, 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 uh, with the casual dress, so I, it, most of you have not yet met our, the CEO, but, but thank you, thank you. Uh, both Henry Block and Tom Block are coming up shortly in the program, but I want to include them and recognize them both at this time for their involvement and support of the library, but also I want to recognize them for their leadership, each as shown in projects, including the Nelson's New Block Building and the University Academy Charter School. If I could ask for a round of applause for all these great individuals at this time. I'm now honored to introduce Tom Block. Tom is a personal friend and who's also served as a director uh, of our bank following his father in that role. As many of you no doubt know, Tom made a decision uh, to leave his position of CEO of H&R Block in 1995 and became a middle school math teacher uh, about five years later, and with uh, Barnett Helsberg, sorry, became a middle school math teacher, and five years later with Barnett Helsberg, founded the University Academy, the charter school. Tom's decision to become a teacher and subsequent success is an inspiration to all of us who believe that the work of one person can make a real and substantial change in a difficult subject, that being urban education, which is rightly considered to be one of the most complex and intractable uh, problems in our community. His talk at the library's Truman Forum, uh, Forum when his book Stand for the Best was published last year was a sellout, and he has continued by hosting a continuing series of, of library of thought uh, here at the library of thought-provoking presentations by national experts entitled What Works in Urban Education. So it is with great and personal and sincere appreciation for so many things that I would like to now give you Tom Block. Thank, thank you, John, for those very kind words. And I'm, I'm going to be brief because no one's here to hear me tonight. I've got the great, great part, which is to introduce 
two of uh, the great people in Kansas City. Uh, I think all of you either know them or would at least agree with me uh, that they are two really great treasures. Uh, Crosby Kemper sort of followed a similar path. You know, he was a, a, a CEO of a family uh, uh, run a business and uh, he left and I think it's fair to say that he uh, certainly found his calling. Uh, I don't really know any other uh, 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 chief executives of public library systems in the country, but I would bet at least a dollar fifty that there is no one, <laughs> no one in this country who is as talented, as creative, as uh, good as Crosby Kemper. And he is a, he even is a good stand-in for Mike Wallace, as you'll see tonight. <laughs> and the other guy is also a really dear friend of mine, and I get to call him Dad. I, I, Crosby isn't quite old enough for that, but um, uh, I, I'm very fortunate in that I, I, know, I know a different side of Henry Block, and it's a side that I can't begin to tell you in words uh, how wonderful that side is. He is a truly a great man, not just a great entrepreneur, not just a great manager, not just a great leader, but a great human being. Um, you know, his mother was a disciple of Ralph Waldo Emerson. She read a lot of his uh, works. And I think uh, many, many years ago, there was an Emerson uh, uh, quotation that stuck with him. It was, if I get this wrong, Dad, help me. Um, the, uh, an institution is the length and shadow of one man. And when I think my grandmother told him this, he didn't, he didn't know what that meant. He, and he didn't know how, how absolutely appropriate that statement is when it comes to himself uh, and to H&R Block. Um, uh, so without further ado, I would like to introduce two of my favorite people and two of the great people in this community, if not in this country, Crosby Camper and Henry Block. Uh, Tom, thank you very, very much for that gracious uh, introduction. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> and, and now your uh, recompense is Tom's book, Stand for the Best, is available on Amazon. <laughs> and uh, he, he wants me to let you know if on your way home you stop at Barnes & Noble or tomorrow morning at Rainy Day Books and buy a copy. If everyone in this room buys a copy, he'll go into the top 100 on Amazon's list. So th thank you. And it is, it is great being here with, uh, with all of you and with one of Kansas City's legends, uh, one of America's legends, uh, Henry Block. And, and this, this is going to be a historical reminiscence about H&R Block, but since we're dealing with history, I do. Henry, I, I happen to have here, the IRS has returned to me my 1988 tax return. It was kind of, it needs a little work. Oh, okay. No, we won't do that, we won't do that tonight. But your career has been a remarkable career, and I want to talk a little bit, and, and the history of H&R Block, a remarkable history, I do want to talk a little bit about a, the, the entrepreneurial aspects of this, how you created the company. And, and I, want to, I want to go back to what may have been, what you've said might, might have been uh, one of the key elements in that, one of the key moments, which is you're, you, you went to war, uh, and, 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 one, and one of your brothers, uh, Leon, also went to war, uh, in World War II, and you, you flew B-17 bombers, 31 missions, I think, uh, over Germany, three, three over Berlin, won the Silver Star with, with oak leaf clusters, and, you know, extraordinary adventure, uh, that great courage. Did that have something to do, did that experience have something to do with your willingness to venture what you ventured in creating H&R Block? No, I really don't think it did. <laughs> <laughs> Th thank you all for being here tonight. <laughs> it, 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 the, the one thing that I got out of it was, I guess, to be sort of a fatalist. Because, I, you know, there were a thousand planes flying on every mission, and a lot of them would get hit, and a lot of them went down. And, and I just felt uh, I was lucky if I made, made it. And uh, uh, so. It made me sort of a fatalist that I couldn't control everything, right. and um, I think that, that that has helped me. So you, you were willing to venture, and, and and during the war you corresponded with your with your brothers right. Dick and Leon, 
Well, if I hadn't been in service, there would be no H&R Block. Because uh, after I flew my missions, and I had 31 over Germany, then I came back and the Air Force sent me to Harvard to study statistical control and in the, in the business school. And uh, while I was there, I came across a booklet uh, in the library. In fact, it all, everything starts in the library. That is the message I want you to come with tonight. I, I, I went to the library one day at noon, found this little booklet, which was a speech by a professor, Sumner Slichter. And um, in that speech, he gave it the Waldorf Astoria, Waldorf Astoria before a group of life insurance companies. And in that speech, he said that business is divided into three groups, big business, small business, and labor. And big business and labor are both very powerful. But small business, which is really the backbone of this country, needs help. And if there was any way they could put some of their money into small business, uh, it would be wonderful. Well, that uh, resonated with me. And, that and, and so you and, and Dick, was it, went to, to, or Leon went to see him at, right. at, at Harvard and, yeah. and ask him, for advice about starting a small business? He wasn't very optimistic. He didn't, yeah. Uh, but, uh, but, you know, all the veterans were, you thought it was a good idea to start a small business because all the veterans were coming home and you thought there were, they, they, they'd need help and, and then and he, he, he didn't think that was such a good idea? Well, he, he said he didn't know. He said he, they, they need help, little businesses, but I don't know if you can make a profitable business out of it or did, not. Did, did he long, live long enough to hear about H&R Block? That I don't know. Yeah. Yeah. I don't know. Well, and, and, and so you, you started a, a business in, in Kansas City, United Business Company with your brothers, and, and uh, you, 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 did, you lot of, did a lot of different things. Uh, there, there's a, a note uh, from, from Leon somewhere in the, in the archives <clears throat> that says you, you were going to do the following things. Bookkeeping, Taxes, collections, typing, and window decorating. Right. So I, I want to know: did, did you, did you and Dick and, and Leon, did you ever actually get up in some windows and decorate no, them? No. But we had about fifty services, and taxes were only one of the fifty. Right. Uh, we didn't know. Not, 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 not that big, big a deal at that point. But when you, when you, when you created the business. You didn't have a lot of money. You had your fifty dollars a month from the from the army for, uh, right. as a veteran, and, and for the Air Force as a veteran, and uh, and so you needed to go borrow some money from a member of your family in New York. New York Capital is a big uh, big big thing here. Right. Uh, a woman, your aunt, great aunt, your great aunt, mm -hmm. and tell 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 us that story about great well, aunt Kate. Um, we thought in order to help these companies, we needed all types of professional help. Somebody in insurance and accounting and whatever, marketing. And, and um, so we went to see her. She was quite wealthy. She lived in the Waldorf Astoria. And my brother and I asked her for a gift of $50,000. A gift. A gift. She said, no, I will, lo I will loan you $5,000 if your father will co-sign the note. Which she was willing to do. But you also proposed to her, didn't, didn't you, Henry, that, that, that she might invest in the company. But she'd rather have the loan with your father on the note. That's, that's right. That's that, a that very small right. amount of money. And she was a woman of Woolman Rink fame. Those of you who know New York or know skating may know Woolman Rink in Central Park. And that, that was your great aunt. Right. And, yeah. and if, if she'd invested instead of just taking the, taking the loan, there'd be a lot more rinks, wouldn't there? That's true. That's true. Well, that, 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 is, that is a great story. So, and incidentally, it was her father. Uh, she grew up in Leavenworth. And it was her father that invited Abraham Lincoln in 1859 to come and visit Leavenworth. The, the Republican Party needed help. Right. And um, he came and uh, spent one night at, with them. That's great. That's, that's a, a wonderful story. And so you, 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 you started United Business Company and we're doing all these various things, not window decorating, but all the other, all the other things. And, uh, and, and you were do, doing this, I think, maybe with, with Leon at that point, and you, put, you, you, you got some business, you needed more business, so you put a want ad in the newspaper. And, well, and who answered that want ad for some help? Well, my mother. Your but, mother. <laughs> 
but no, I, I've got to back up a little bit because uh, uh, we had no business, and Leon decided to go back oh, he was to, going law to law school. school. Law he school. was going to the University right. of Missouri Law School. Right. So he quit and went back to school, and we returned the five thousand dollars to our great aunt, and then I stayed with it. I, I was single, and. Um, um, eventually I got a client and a few more, and then I had more than I could do. So um, uh, that's when I put an ad in the paper for some help. And my mother answered it and said, uh, uh, I know who you, you should hire, your brother Dick. <laughs> and uh, Dick was married at the time, and I said, Mom, I can't hire Dick. I, we, I'm not making that kind of money. And, um, but I did. Mom, and, uh, mom was influential, I she guess. She was very in, influential. In that, in that decision. She always got what she wanted. What you wanted. <laughs> and, and, and so you, you're building a, a small company with a lot of business services, and, 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 and I've heard, I've read that you <coughs> and, and Dick walked up and down uh, the streets. You, had, you, had, you were located at 39th and Main, is that right, across from the old cat store? Well, 31st and Main 31st originally. And Main, initially. Okay. Yeah. And but eventually, eventually at Westport and Maine. Westport and Maine. Uh, mm -hmm. That's right, Westport and Maine across from the old Cat's mm -hmm. Drugstore. But we did walk, we each took one side, one of, the side of the street and tried to get some clients. But things were, and things were, you, you were building a small, a small business at that point. But as, as happens in, in every great entrepreneur's life, there's that, the big idea moment. There's the, there's the, there's the moment at, at, at which the, the light bulb goes on, the eureka moment. And the eureka moment actually wasn't, the idea wasn't yours. You were about to drop the tax business. Right. At that time, tax season ended March 15th in, instead of April 15th. In fact, Tom was born on March 16th. Mine usually ends in August, by the way, but go, go ahead. Pardon? No. You're, you're August, in August. Yeah, I mean, no, go ahead. Um, so uh, we decided uh, in keeping books for our clients, we had to fill out all of their tax returns payroll taxes, excise taxes, sales taxes, income taxes, and so on. So we decided to... you were kind of throwing that in as a bookkeeping service, really. They, they were all included, right. free, right. Uh, so we decided to quit preparing income taxes for a few other people that we did. We charged $5 to fill out a tax return. Now I'm, I'm talking about uh, in the 1950s, and we charged $5 and uh, we decided we were working seven days a week and almost every night and um, that we would quit doing tax returns. And one person, I mean, do you want to continue yeah, with Yeah, tell, tell us the story, John, John White? John right. White, yeah. Uh, a fellow named John White who was a display advertising salesman for the Kansas City Star. It used to, a newspaper in Kansas City it used to exist, that's all. <laughs> And um, we, all, we, we prepared John's return for several years before then, and he came up to have his tax return done. We were up on the second floor of a building, and uh, like everybody else, we told him, John, we're, we've gone out of the tax business, so uh, we can't do your tax return. But, um, and he said, like they all said, who will do it? And we said, we don't know. but. But I'm sure you can find somebody. And um, John left, went back to the star, and he was in the display advertising department. And so he came back with some display ads, uh, pictures that had been drawn of people pulling out their hair, <laughs> somebody behind an eight ball, and so on. And said, so before you get out of the business, why not try, try to make a separate business out of preparing tax returns. And so you did the ad, people tearing out their hair, $5, dollars $5. $5. And we kept that price at $5 for 12 years. Oh, amazing. Which I think helped us very much. And we got, yeah. um, I mean, our ads were one thing, but the, uh, the price helped. The recommendations were much more powerful. But, but so you put the ad in the newspaper and you're out making calls on, on another business and, and Dick, call, Dick called you? 
Well, no, we gave up that other business. No, but you were, but you were out of it. When, when you yeah. put the ad in, yeah, when and we that put, day, the next day, you, you were the next day. You I'm, were you were out. I was out, and I went to a seat cover business to pick up their checkbooks and so on. And um, when I walked in, they said, "You're supposed to call your brother." And he said, "We've got an office full of people." And, uh, come, come back as quickly as you can. If, if you'll pardon the expression, there were lines around the block. <laughs> Sorry, every, every present. So, so this is a huge success, and you, 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 you. Well, it worked well that year, except we were sued. <laughs> um, we were sued by CPAs and lawyers because they could not advertise. Back in those days, doctors couldn't advertise, and lawyers couldn't, CPAs couldn't. Uh, we didn't feel like we were any in, in that group. Right. Uh, because we were simply filling out tax returns. And so a group and, of CPAs and, and lawyers got so together, they sued you. We and thought we should move to some city where maybe they wouldn't sue us, where they'd leave <laughs> us alone. And we talked about where should we go, you know, Topeka, Wichita, uh, Springfield, and so on. And I believe it was Dick said, how about New York? That's bigger than all these cities put together. And that's what happened. So uh, in October 1st, 1955, I moved to New York and uh, opened seven offices. We opened two more in Kansas City. And uh, that was the beginning of it. And so, so, so the, the the idea, the great the great idea, turns out to be uh, successful. And at one point in your your career, Henry, you said there comes a point when you have to gamble, and and obviously yeah. you, you you reach that point, you gamble on the on the tax business. But it, you also were were lucky uh, at that moment because the IRS decided in 1954, right at this moment, you decided to go into the the tax business full bore. They got out of it. They used to prepare anybody's tax return free of charge. But of course, if they made a mistake, uh, they wouldn't stand behind it because they said, you know, we didn't charge you anything. So, right, yeah. And I the IRS decided to get out. And they used Kansas City to test that. Right. And so people would go to the IRS office and then see, remember our ads and come to see us. Right. We had right. a lot of lucky breaks all and the way through it. And, and you know, uh, the uh, it, it, it was lucky, but obviously you have to be prepared to take advantage of the luck and to and and, and to grasp the situation and work hard at it. I, I'm told that maybe there there might have been an inspiration in your childhood, uh, a movie you saw when you were 11 or 12. Oh. <laughs> uh, do you remember that? Yes, uh, there were the life of Louis Pasteur. Right, Paul. I mean, this playing. is probably before you were born. I've seen the movie, but Henry. I've seen you've the seen movie. the movie. Yeah, yeah, the Life of Pasteur. Paul Muni plays Paul Louis Muni. Pasteur. That's yeah, right. Absolutely. It was a great movie, and he he did so much and gave so much. It it did influence me because I always wanted to do something, but uh, and, and, to and, help and, out. And you have you've given you've given a lot back to the community as as Louis Pasteur did. But he also he was a guy who who. Who kind of decided he had the right idea and went with it? And you, you, you and Dick, uh, you created a, a large company. You started to expand Columbia and Topeka, but also you mentioned New York. You had offices in, in New York, but you wanted to expand more in New York, and you opened the first franchise. In, in one way, you were one of the first franchise businesses in the United yes, States. We and, were. And, and, and the story about your going to New York to actually open the franchise business. It, I understand there was kind a of car interesting. That, uh, that first tax season in New York was our second tax season, and it was a tough one. And we, for example, we hired a lot of people to start work, and none of them showed up. <laughs> but in New York, we just ran another ad, and more people came in. Um, and, and then we had to instruct them. But uh, but I understand you, you and Dick went around in a car to try to look for locations and, and, and talk to the franchisees, and it, we, it wasn't we exactly what We had we, Dick's old con, uh, Buick convertible, and uh, it, it was an old car, and the windows wouldn't go down. If you wanted to open a window, you just lifted it out and put it in the back seat. <laughs> and uh, why, we used it for delivering supplies, and uh, while we were there, um, it also wouldn't go into reverse. 
<laughs> and uh, you know, be one careful day, where you parked it, right? I parked it by the hotel I was living at and on a hill. And I was always careful to, so there wouldn't be anybody in front of me. <laughs> but somehow or other, when I got, came there the next morning, there was somebody in front of me. Ooh. And I just had to wait till he drove away. <laughs> high, high, high finance and, and, and big, big corporate activity. <clears throat> but at, at any rate, um, New York was a tough place to uh, open a business. And uh, it reminds me of the song, if you can make it there, you can make it, it anywhere. anywhere. New York, New York. Which was written by a Kansas City, and as you know. No, I didn't know that. John oh, Kander. Oh, yeah, John written Kander. Written by John Kander. You're you right. Know, I'm sure. You're right. Yeah. But uh, so after that season, we decided to sell New York. Yeah. Uh, we didn't, neither one of us wanted to move there, and we didn't think we could operate it without living there. So we uh, put an ad in the paper, and we only got one answer. And, uh, but we sold it to those fellows. They didn't have any money. They, had, they only had $10,000 between them, but that's how the franchising started. You we said, that. we'll take your 10000 if you pay us a royalty on the business you do. So entirely out of necessity, us, you, you created this franchise in New York. Necessity and, and, and the desire by, not to have accident. to lift the window out of the car right. anymore. <laughs> no. yeah. and, and, and so the, the <coughs> business grows. You become a national business. You've got all, all, the, all these offices. And, and you feel the need to go public. In 1962, you, you went public, but the CPAs kind of enter into this again, don't they? Yeah, we decided to go public, and I can't really tell you why, but it was back then, a lot of companies were going public, and we didn't see much downside to it. And um, so in 1961, we were going public, and to go public, you need three things. You need a lawyer, you need an accountant, and you need an underwriter. So we picked uh, three big ones. Uh, our lawyer did pick the accountant and the underwriter. And halfway through the audit, that, that's what they do first. They audit your books. They didn't show The auditors didn't show up. And we called them, and they said, we can't audit your books. We said, you can't audit our books? Why? They said, because we, our headquarters feels like you're competing with our industry. So the CPAs would, the wouldn't CPAs. let you do it. Well, they couldn't do that today, but back then, right. I guess they could. Conspiracy so they, against trade. Uh, the, the underwriting fell through, which is one of the best things that ever happened to us. Because we kept, we still owned 100% of the company. Right. And it was growing so fast. But eventually, when you did go public, you used a Kansas City company. Is that is that we right? We used a company Kenneth called Baum. George K. Baum. George K. Baum. And uh, they were a small company at the time. Uh, and but we only went public with the center part of the country, right. Midwest, and we we owned the rest of it, and which is and prob probably made a, a lot of people in our part of the country pretty happy when they uh, when they well, saw what happened to their H and R stock came out at four dollars a share and immediately went down. <laughs> But uh, eventually it started. But growing. obviously a huge, a huge success. You grow to be one of the biggest uh, companies in the country, a uh, Fortune 500 company. <clears throat> but it, you know, it's always interesting, it seems to me, Henry, in, at, w w when discussing a great success story like yours and, and Dick's and, and, uh, and Leon's and H&R Block, uh, to talk about the, the mistakes or the hard times. In 1972, you, you ran into a, a little bit of a roadblock with, uh, with the IRS. You'd had 17 years of increasing earnings and, and, and growth, yeah. and then in 1972, you hit a little bit of a wall. We did. The uh, commissioner at that time <clears throat> wrote on the 1040, which was sent to everybody, uh, if you have any tax questions, do not go to commercial tax preparers. Uh, call the IRS. And then, in addition Ouch. to that, he said, taxes really aren't very complicated. They're so simple, even a fifth grader can fill them out. Well, of course, many school, school teachers tried it in fifth grade, and not, the kids could not fill them out. And, uh, it's like uh, the old Groucho Marx sort of remark. He says, it's so simple, a 10-year-old child could understand it. Could someone please go out and get me a 10-year-old child? <laughs> and um, so our board met and suggested I call on him in Washington, which I did. And um, <clears throat> uh, Jerome Kurtz was his name. <coughs> 
And he said, Mr. Block, you, you don't understand. He said, I'm putting them, everybody else in that business out of, out of business. I'm helping you. And I thought, well, you know, with friends like that. Yeah, who don't need enemies. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> but uh, that's exactly what happened. We could, uh, we could withstand the loss of business. The next year, we cut our fees. And we had tremendous growth. And so the company grows. And I have to tell this personal story that you remember uh, about uh, uh, the, the moment. People have been attacking your business like the IRS commissioner in various ways. Uh, and uh, I remember once uh, w when I was at, at UMB, uh, we had a trust conference. And uh, we invited you to come and, a number, and lots of other people came. And Jack Kemp. Uh, the late great Jack Kemp was our was our featured speaker, and I introduced him to you, and you had a nice conversation with Jack Kemp, and then and, and then I introduced Jack Kemp, and he got up and, and to speak, and of course he was interested in in uh, lowering taxes and simplifying taxes and flat taxes, and so the first words out of his mouth were, "I'm here to put Henry Block out of business." <laughs> Jack was Kemp was the, the NFL. Of my life. He was the NFL quarterback. In, yeah, an NFL, yeah, an NFL Buffalo. quarterback. Maybe, maybe one too yep. many hits. You think? <laughs> yeah. So, yeah. so, but the the company has has been hugely successful. You and your family have been been hugely successful, but you've been entrepreneurial in other ways. And I and I wonder if there's a similarity between what you've done well, with the company and what you've done for the community. We have a debt to Kansas City. I mean, without Kansas City, we would have nothing. Um, so we have a debt and uh, try to repay it. Well, you, you certainly had. You, you, you have. You, you've been head of the United Way, president of the Civic Council, uh, and, uh, very involved with the American Jewish Com uh, Committee, uh, your scholarship program for C students, which is a great thing, the Block School everybody knows about. But there's a very special thing in our community that you've been in involved in, and, 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 and it seems to me it's taken some of the entrepreneurial spirit that uh, that Kansas City spirit that you have uh, to hang in there through the, the commentary and the, the, the issues and the controversy, and that's the block building at the, at the Nelson, which turns out today, uh, Paul Goldberger in the New Yorker said it was the best museum building built in the last 30 years. It had a lot of critics at the beginning. It, too, it did. But it is. It's a remarkable building, and it, it uh, is. Mark Wilson, the director, deserves Mark, Mark all deserves the credit. credit in, in, in yeah. you and and and, and the, the other trustees. But it, it, it's it, it's a a great thing that uh, that you you've done there. Um, and I I wonder as you look back uh, over your career and 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 you think about the the high points and the and the low points. What 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 strikes you as a, as a great moment in the, in the history of your career? That's hard to say, but I, I know the people that work for the company just love the work they do. And uh, I know when the company was much smaller and I knew more people in it, they didn't want to go home at night. They just wanted to work. They were very conscientious. They were doing something and, that was, and that was they good enjoyed and successful. It. And, um, yeah, and you know, you 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 said we were uh, helping people, and and I, you know, I do hear criticism, but really, we're doing the government a big favor. Without without the company, a lot of tax returns would be filed and that shouldn't be filed. Well, and you, 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 that, that early ad that John John White had of people tearing their hair out that is absolutely true. You know, there are those of us yeah. who try to do our taxes on our own, and yeah, I, and we have I can't less, do mine anymore. We have less hair than the. <laughs> Exactly, exactly. And it, at one point, you, you said that your your mother's vision for you, and if you hadn't hadn't uh, got gotten into the the United Business Company and the H and R Block business, you might have become a math teacher. And and uh, and, and and it's it's interesting to me that uh, my friend uh, Tom, your son, uh, that that he did become a math teacher. That's and, true. And you know your legacy. You've got a legacy in a lot of ways. All of your children have been involved in the community. And, and, and been leaders in the community, and that, that must give you a great deal of uh, satisfaction as well. Definitely. Well, Henry, I, before we go upstairs, I want to say one, one, one last thing. Uh, and, uh, you know, we're honored by your presence here. You are a legend in the life of, of Kansas City. Uh, about uh, 31 years ago, I think, uh, the, the chamber named you Mr. Kansas City. 
And uh, I just want to say you're still Mr. Kansas City. Ladies and gentlemen, if you would join us upstairs, uh, we'll cut the ribbon in a, in a couple of minutes. Well, I think we want Henry and, and Russ and Tom and David and Mark Sanders. Okay, great. Okay. Great. Okay. Uh -huh. <laughs> 